Uh, thanks a lot uh, for having me here. It's, uh, it's quite nice to be able to, to present here in the, the United States. So I will try to provide a, a high-level overview of the current debates regarding uh, online platform slavability, uh, both in the United States and the uh, European Union, uh, especially given the fact that the EU recently published uh, the Digital Services Act, which is a, a new regulation which aims at uh, regulating uh, online platforms uh, and which will have uh, impact, hopefully, on the, the spread of uh, disinformation uh, online. So, uh, first of all, and I think that's something we've already established today, disinformation and misinformation have actual conse consequences on society and uh, social media and online platforms are usually uh, huge vectors for the spread of those information disorder. This can lead to violence, as uh, has been the case in Burma during the, the, the genocide against the Rohingya community to uh, electoral manipulation, as was the case in 2016 during the, the Brexit campaign, or to the slowing down of sanitary policy, uh, as has been the case during uh, COVID-19. Uh, and of course, uh, disinformation has also been a huge problem in the, in the war in Ukraine, but I, I think we, we already have discussed uh, on this subject, so I'm not going to dwell on this. So uh, online platforms uh, did have reactions to, to misinformation and disinformation by enacting policies. And to do so, they rely on content moderation, which they do either through uh, human moderation, so using moderators that actually uh, read and regulate content, or through uh, algorithmic ad algorithm and uh, artificial intelligence. So these are some examples of uh, actions taken by platforms to, to regulate or to at least uh, work on disinformation so they can sometimes they just flag some contents without deleting them. They can indicate alternative uh, sources for information or they can go even further by deleting content or suspending users uh, as has been the case for former President uh, Donald Trump which was suspended for, for, from Twitter and Meta for uh, I think at least two years. He recently came back on the platform. So at the time, uh, online platforms have pretty much their hands free when they choose how to regulate uh, information and publication on their services. So it's mostly self-regulations. There have been a lot of critics uh, on these self-regulations for several reasons. First of all, platforms decide themselves and they can just choose to change their policies uh, at any given time. Twitter is currently a, a prime example of this as it looks like uh, Twitter's policy depends mostly on Elon Musk's mood whenever he wakes up, uh, which is not always easy for people to know what, how they will be treated uh, legally and, um, I mean, not legally, but from the platform point of view. There is also a lot of lack of transparency. Some users sometimes see their content deleted or uh, invisibil invisibilized without them knowing why or for how long. And they don't have a lot of recourse against those actions. And finally, a lot of experts are claiming that this is an issue as it is a contractualization of freedom of expression as platforms choose what they host or what they don't host. And given their important role uh, on the social and communication infrastructure, it gives them a lot of power, which should maybe not be in the end of private enterprises, but remain uh, democratically governed by society as a whole. So platform has also been accused uh, of using the recommender system to favor polarizing content such as disinformation or hate speech, but they also hide behind the fact that their algorithms are usually uh, private or they don't remit and that, so they, they say that they cannot explain how they actually uh, promote content, but uh, which causes problem regarding regulation. And finally, platforms also benefit from a liability exception regarding the content posted by their user, and we will discuss this a bit later. So uh, the EU recently published the Digital Services Act, which aims at better regulating uh, the online market. And I will uh, share with you uh, what I believe is uh, one of the best communication from the European Commission in the past few months. And it's a tweet from Thierry Breton, which is the, the commissioner for the internal market in the EU.
Okay, so let's go back a bit to discuss this uh, liability exemption uh, for online platform. <laughs> Sorry. So uh, it was established in the 1990s because at the time uh, the internet was developing, people started going online, posting content, and questions arose regarding the li liability of hosting services and in online intermediaries. So at the time, the goal uh, was to push for a faster development of the internet and digital services. So uh, both the US and uh, Europe decided to provide with uh, an exemption liability for uh, intermediary services. The US was the first to do so with section 230 of the Communication Decency Act in 1996, which states that provider of interactive computer services should not be considered publishers of the content posted by third parties and therefore not incur liability. Uh, and uh, the, this provision also allows those services to engage in content moderation by deleting content they deem to be not uh, appropriate for the services. In the EU, the, the similar exemption was provided by Article 14 of the e-commerce directive in 2001. So hosting services were exempted from liability under certain condition. They had to be unaware of the presence of such content and once they're uh, acquired that knowledge they had to they have to act uh, fast expeditiously to remove them in order to see their uh, liability uh, not in order for their liability not to be engaged uh, in the eu there are some more conditions that were established by the european court of justice that states that this liability exemption only applies when the when the hosting services or the online platform act in a, in a passive way and this is actually a question which uh, has been br brought to more attention given that online platforms, unlike the hosting services from the past, have somewhat a more active role as they, act, as they choose which contents they, tr they put uh, first or not through the algorithm. So the question is, under this, uh, with this role, do they still benefit from the protection under Section 230? And uh, regarding EU law, are they still considered to be neutral, technical, and passive, which were the criteria established by the ECG in the Google France case? Uh, this question pr probably should uh, be answered with a yes, as in 2021, in a case uh, against YouTube, uh, the Court of Justice in uh, Luxembourg stated that recommender systems do not entail knowledge of illegal content nor responsibility for online platforms. But as we will see later, the EU decided to impose new obligations on those platforms through the DSA. But let's stay in the, in the US for a bit with a current court, uh, court case in front of the Supreme Court, uh, Google versus Gonzalez. So let's start with the, the fact of the case. So in 2015, 23-year-old uh, Noemi Gonzalez was killed during the terrorist attack in Paris, and her parents sued YouTube as well as other social media such as Facebook and Twitter because they were hosting content uh, directly uh, posted by the Islamic State. So the parents accused YouTube of aiding and abating terrorism by recommending those videos through the, algorithm, algor through the algorithm. The case was first dismissed by the courts in California, but was then uh, heard by the Supreme Court. The oral arguments were done just a few months ago, so the case is still pending. So the question at hand is, is the role, uh, is the fact that Google rely on those recommend, recommender algorithms to promote the video, until Google uh, liability for those content. The arguments from the plaintiff is that uh, this use means that YouTube has an active role in relation to the terrorist videos and that when they choose how to display content through algorithm, platform should not uh, receive protection under section 230. On the other side, the arguments from the defendants which Basic, which consists mostly of uh, uh, online platforms themselves, as well as free speech advocates, is that if platforms were to be held liable for the content they host, they would, su they would be subject to a massive amount of lawsuit, which will trigger uh, over-regulation and over-censorship of content online, radically changing the internet as we know it today. 
And uh, another argument is that it's not up to the Supreme Court to decide whether or not Section 230 is or should or still not valid, but that action should come from Congress through uh, bipartisan action. So I'm not going to go too much into the, the legal uh, battle here because I'm not a specialist of US law, but this was just to, to pose a bit like the, the debate here in the United States and see how in, in the EU uh, the commission and the parliament chose to, to answer those challenges regarding online platforms. So the DSA, the Digital Services Act, is part of the EU strategy uh, regarding online platforms together with the EU digital market arts and other uh, regulations such as uh, the, G the General Data Protection or the Inter Artificial Intelligence Act, which are all regulations aiming at better uh, regulating online, the online world. The, the DSA was proposed by the Commission in December 2020, and uh, it was appro approved in October 2022 and uh, published as well in December 2022. It's quite a speedy process for EU law to be adopted. It usually takes much more time than that. The regulation was pushed a lot by friends who really wanted it to be uh, published before it gave back the EU presidency uh, at the beginning of this year. So uh, another interesting feature of the DSA is its tier structure. It's, it's div it divides in online intermediaries in four categories. So uh, intermediary services, which are basically everyone providing service online from, uh, let's say, uh, internet service provider like AT&T to online platform like Facebook. Second category are hosting services, then online platforms. And finally, the last category are very large online platforms, which are which are the platforms which have more than 45 million active users on a monthly basis in the European Union. And of course, the larger you are, the more obligation you have to, to respect. Now, what were the goals of the, the DSA? Well, like we saw in the, in the video, is to protect the rights of users online ensuring a safe, predictable, and trusted online environment, and provide uh, appropriate supervision of digital services. There were no major changes uh, regarding the online platform's liability that was described before, uh, even though there was the introduction of a Good Samaritan clause uh, encouraging online platforms to actively moderate uh, illegal and harmful content. There has been uh, a new obligation for online platforms to delete illegal content at the request of appropriate authorities. Now, the DSA itself does not define illegal content, so illegal content still remains defined either by EU law or by national member state law. And uh, so depending on the country, it usually involves counterfeit goods, promotion of terrorism, child pornography, uh, promotion of drugs, etc. And finally, the DSA uh, imposed new transparency and due diligence obligations for online platforms, uh, very large online platforms. Let's have uh, an overview of those, of those uh, obligations. So it's very high level overview. Uh, as we don't have time to go all the way into the regulation, which is quite large. But regarding transparency, uh, pl online platforms would have to, will have to provide their user with certain information regarding the terms, uh, their term and conditions. Notably, they will have to indicate which content is allowed or not on the platform. And they will have to respect those terms and conditions and inform their users of any major change on, the, on those. Uh, platforms will have to put in place a notice and takedown mechanism allowing their users to notify them when they stumble upon content they believe are either illegal or contrary to the platform term of services. If uh, a platform receives a notice action, a notice under this mechanism, it will be considered to be aware of the presence of the content, meaning it might lose its protection under the liability exception in Article 14 of the e-commerce directive. Uh, platforms will have to issue their user statements of reason whenever they take any action on their content. So if a content is deleted or uh, demonetized, users will have to know why and they also will have to know how they can uh, intend a recourse against this uh, action. Furthermore, regarding recommender system, online platforms will have to inform their users on the main parameters 
regarding how they work. It does not mean that they will have to share the algorithm with everyone, but they will at least need to indicate in clear terms how the algorithm works and why certain content are priorities over others. And regarding the larger online platforms, they will also have to provide at least one option for the users to uh, receive recommendation not based on the profiling of their personal data. And finally, and I think uh, on transparency, it's one of the most interesting uh, uh, provision in the Digital Services Act. Researchers will have some uh, access to platforms data, mostly regarding the, the risks and their content moderation practices. There will be a, the, the commission will put in place a mechanism for researchers from uh, sub, from university to actually receive certification to ask for this data. But this will allow for future research on uh, how online platforms actually work to be conducted. And finally, there are some due diligence obligations to put in place for the online platforms. This only concerns the very large ones, so uh, smaller platforms won't have to go on to undergo these. So very large online platforms will have to undergo a yearly risk assessments, which includes, for example, the use of the platform to to uh, the use of the platform that could be that could threaten democracy uh, that could lead to gender based violence that could lead to uh, health disinformation and platforms will then have to put in place mitigating measures to reduce those risks and furthermore uh, on due diligence not only will the platform have to do this risk assessment on their own they will also have to undergo uh, independent audits on a yearly basis and all those three obligations all those information coming from those assessments will have to be shared with both the european commission the and the vetted researcher I just mentioned uh, a few minutes ago. So uh, I will uh, now conclude. So those obligations have been put in Europe, but of course, if you look at the very large online platforms, those are the first numbers that uh, were received, that were provided by platforms themselves. The actual list of lobs uh, is yet to be released by the commission. And if you look at those, out of the, of the biggest one, all of them, uh, except for TikTok, are based in the US, which means that the US, that uh, even though the regulation is on in Brussels, it will have a lot of impact here across the Atlantic. So uh, what are the future questions regarding platform regulation? In the US, there are still a lot, uh, some court cases uh, going, on, going, going on regarding the fact that uh, platform regulation itself could not survive uh, First Amendment scrutiny, uh, which uh, is not as much as a problem in Europe, given the fact that freedom of speech is not totally the same uh, in Brussels and in uh, Washington. Of course, uh, for, uh, regulation alone won't fix, won't fix the issue of disinformation, whether in the EU or in the US. Other uh, areas should be focused on just as uh, data privacy, which uh, usually allows uh, those platforms to provide users with very personal con personalized content, which sometimes has a negative effect on political polarization. Media literacy is, of course, uh, a very important issue, and that was actually just discussed in the last uh, presentation. And some other issues regarding media, media, such as media concentration, also poses great risks to the information market itself. Finally, I would just like to finish that by saying that even though the regulations I just mentioned are enacted in Brussels, there is a potential uh, there is a potential change that those regulations will set global standards also applicable uh, in the United States and uh, in the rest of the world through what is called the Brussels effect, which is uh, a phenomenon which is observed uh, when regulation from uh, a large entity such as the EU has effect globally because sometimes like companies is, for companies it is easier to adopt those new standards uh, at the global level than to just put in place specific specific um, rules just for the EU so for example uh, those rules on terms and conditions Facebook might just decide to give the same information to its user worldwide and not just to focus on the EU level, EU market. So, uh, thank you very much for listening, and I will now uh, open the floor for any questions.
Hello. Thank you for this. I'm amazed we've covered this topic and we're still finding sort of new ways to look at it this late in the day. So uh, really impressed. Um, I'm curious, I think you were getting at this in one of your later slides and Lee McIntyre made this point about how prosecuting the crime or the criminal. And in this case, the criminal to me seems to be the algorithm and the crime is sort of what comes out of that. In the EU, like you said, they don't have access to the algorithms of these US companies. So what's the conversation in the EU about that of other ideas about having different actually operational functions of these companies in the EU to actually constrict the output? Or is it more just, hey, when we see these things, we're going to take it down, we're going to use these levers, but we actually can't interact on you know what's actually causing this information to be promoted? Yeah, so it's actually a quite a good question. Uh, it's hard to answer because a lot of time when uh, confronted to the question of algorithmic regulation, online platform themselves, we say, okay, we have this algorithm, but we don't really know how it works. It's a black box, uh, so we cannot tell you. The regulations aims to force platforms to share their data. Uh, they, will, they won't have to share their algorithm uh, open source because that will be, of course, uh, detrimental to freedom of commerce and tra trade secrets. But the commission will have access to the platform algorithm and they are actually putting in place now a team uh, center for algor algorithmic transparency in the EU. So this will be part for at least for the very large platform of the risk assessments. So they will have access, they will look into it. Honestly, will it work? I don't know. It will depend on the, on the amount of money and the political will of the commission. Will they be able to actually stand, fight in, fr stand in front of those huge corporations that have much more means that they, that they do? So that's, that's a question for the future, but it's something that the commission will, will really look into this question of algorithms. Hi, so thank you so much for being here. I actually just learned about the Brussels effect in my EU in the world class. So I was like, oh, there it is. Wow, outside of class, um, practical applications. Um, so I was wondering, you brought up an interesting point where a lot of EU member states have differing conceptualizations of illegal content. And I was wondering, in your research, have you seen anything about how the EU is going to mitigate those different conceptual conceptualizations among member states and between member states in the EU itself? Because this is a very valiant effort, but if we, you know, let's say platforms take an effort to block terrorist content in Poland, which Poland definitely thinks is illegal content, but then somewhere else, maybe in Spain, it's being shared and people are still seeing it in Spain, but not in Poland. So how, how is the EU, how, how will the EU, I should say, and social media companies overcome that um, challenge? Uh, I cannot speak for social media companies, uh, but at least the, the DSA also put in place a new entity, which is called the European Board for Digital Services, whose goal will be to coordinate different the different member states and their responses. Of course, uh, there might be content that will be illegal in one country and not in another. I think on that platform might be able to to deal with this because it's already happening. Uh, you've probably never seen it here because you're in the United States, but if you go to, in, in the, some contents are illegal in some EU content, but not in the other. For example, if we, dis, if we talk about uh, denial of the Holocaust, it's forbidden, it's under law in countries like Belgium, Germany, or France, but not in every EU country. And online platforms know that, and sometimes I already stumble upon myself personally on the, this tweet had been removed because it is contrary to Belgian law on this or French law on this. So there might still be some differences, uh, but I think the, the reason why there was no agreement on this at EU level is because of political negotiations. So, of course, at, at the time, it will remain an issue, and it will be, of course, a challenge as well for the platforms themselves because they will have to check with national legislation. Um, I'm Jess Dawson from the Army Cyber Institute. You made a comment um, towards the end of your presentation about algorithms and being a black box and you know being sort of trade secrets. Why do we accept that as 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 a as a premise? Um, these algorithms are decision making at scale, and you know we wouldn't allow medicine to be put out into you know practice without testing it and knowing how it works, et cetera, mostly. Um, but why do we accept this? Do you think at at scale that these algorithms that we can just deploy 
them and and not know how they work and not how, know how they come up with their decisions? And is the EU looking at challenging that premise as, as they move forward with some of these this regulation? Uh, it's an excellent remark, and I, I I don't know why we accepted it because I, I think it's probably due to the fact that regarding digital, usually regulations comes. Too, too, uh, not too fast comes uh, after the facts has been enacted. So it's it's been years that we have we know we have these issues with algorithm. The EU is trying to correct it, but will it work? Will it not work? Uh, we don't know. I think there might be an, uh, there there has been a lot of pushback from the platform itself, and uh, as well as lobbying efforts to block any kind of regulation. And it happened in Brussels. It's probably happening in Washington as well because I know there has there have been some efforts for platform regulation here in the U.S. Uh, but f until now, it, nothing concrete has come out. Uh, probably some person in the audience may, may know more about this than I do. Uh, but yeah, I, I think your point is very valid, and I hope in the future. We, we will be able to control algorithms before they come out. I know the EU is trying to work on this for uh, artificial intelligence by enacting the, the AI Act, but even then it will probably come out after like GPT-6 or GPT-7, which might be already too late for any substantial effect. And of course, there is also the question of uh, what if we regulate in Europe or in the US and China or Russia doesn't do it and then they take the lead on this. And that might also be an issue uh, if we are lagging behind on technology just because we have regulation. So it's it's always a hard balance to find between protecting users and uh, human rights and allowing for business to develop and not being lagging behind. Time for one more question, if anyone has one. If only someone closer to me asked the question. <laughs> Hi, uh, Katria Tomko. Um, I'm a disinformation intelligence analyst. And I have a question about the DSA and whether there is any sort of bite um, under the subheading of due diligence. If VLOPs or VLOPs or however they're um, saying the acronym, uh, if they fail to provide data for researchers, is there any fine, is there any bite to this? I'm especially interested as we see the Twitter API being suspended to researchers. And I'm curious to know whether we maybe, and this is speculative, maybe do you foresee a future where we have data provision by default rather than by request? Uh, at the moment, it's still going to be uh, the exact regime, of course, is not known since the regulation still needs to be put in place by the European Commission, but it's going to be uh, at the request, of course, of researchers and platforms will have ways to restrict the data they gave. Uh, they, can, they can invoke like trade secrets or data protection. And I don't, I don't doubt they will do it because they, they don't like sharing their info, of course. Uh, but uh, regarding VLOPs, at least, uh, the, e -commi the Commission itself will be responsible for implementation and respect of the DSA, and they will have the possibility to give out fines if uh, they found out that there are breach of the regulation. And the Commission for the, the, the EU has done a bit like they did with the GDPR by providing a big stick to the regulator uh, as fines can go up to 6% of a, turn, of a company global turnover, which can rack up to like a few million or a few tens, a few million of dollars, which can always be like a detriment, a, a big uh, encouragement to respect the regulation. John, uh, I think that's all we have for this slot. We'll be coming back at 4.30 for some global disinformation lab presentations. Thanks, everybody.